let's go to the Lord in prayer yet again. Father, we bow before you as your people. And we are humbled at the privilege of worshiping you. You who alone deserve the glory and the honor and the majesty. We adore you, not merely because of the blessings that you give us in life and the things that we're thankful for, but we worship you because of who you are. We pray, Lord, that as we open your word, that you would apply the truth of your word by the Holy Spirit to our hearts and that we would leave this place, move to deeper points of repentance, a deeper and more meaningful, mature walk with Christ and with one another. And we ask this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you find your way to Romans chapter 7, we've been in this chapter and we will continue to be in this chapter. And where we are in this chapter, in verse 7, is the thickest part of the thickest thicket in the book of Romans. Uh, this is extremely complex theology. And so um, if you are finding yourself having a little bit of difficulty following Paul's train of thought as he's inspired by the Holy Spirit of how exactly sin and the law relate, you are not alone. We're looking at some verses and some truths that most of us, most of the time, just sort of slide over. We just know it's there and just agree that it's God's word and that's about as far as we move into it. And so we desperately need the guidance of the Holy Spirit to understand why this discussion of the law and sin is so crucial to our lives, in our behavior, in the decisions that we make, in our morality and our obedience to the Lord. We must allow the Lord to show us these truths and to apply them squarely upon our hearts. So I'm not sure if you really picked up last time, uh, but Paul has uh, cast the law of Moses in what we could easily call a less than favorable light. In other words, as we read chapter 7, last part of chapter 6, first part of chapter 7, um, we may ask ourselves, so is Paul not really a fan of the Old Testament law? Because a lot of the things that he says imply that. I mean, think about what we have been talking about to this point. He talks about the fact that we are released from the law having died to that which held us captive. That's verse 6. Well, if we use terminology like being released from something, that's usually a good thing, right? I was released from my captors. I was released from bondage. I was released from incarceration. Those are normally things that we would look forward to. And here Paul says he was released from the law. Well, I thought the law was a good thing. Why would you want to be released from something that's good? And so it raises a question that Paul knows uh, he has said by the Holy Spirit, what he said, I, I'd rather, uh, raises a question. So he beats us to the punch and he asks the question himself, which is not unusual for Paul to ask these kind of leading rhetorical questions to kind of progress the argument, uh, this imaginary opponent he anticipates a lot of the time. And so in verse 7, we begin by reading, what then shall we say? That the law is sin? And then he says, by no means. But, and he continues on, and that's what we'll look at this morning. 
He says, absolutely it's not sin. But that being said, there are some things we need to understand about it. So let's look at the rest of these verses through verse 12. What then shall we say that the law is sin? By no means. Yet, if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised a life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. So the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. That's really the main point that he's communicating in these verses. The law of Moses is holy, righteous, and good. It is so important for us to remember. The law is the very standard of God's expectations of his creatures. I cannot emphasize that enough. We really must, we need to be reminded of that truth today. We are not to ignore the character and the nature of God. So many people are under the assumption that we are a law unto ourselves. That we make the rules. We know what is right. We know what is wrong. Not because it's voted on in Congress, but because the very nature of God causes it to be so. Friends, morality and holiness are not subjective. We must not ever practice a kind of situational ethics where our morality, our decision making, is based on popular opinion or on what the culture says. We've seen this glaringly in our uh, lives even over the last week, even last week. A church in Dallas voted and it passed to embrace homosexuality, which they had been doing all along. They just made it official in the sense that uh, homosexual behavior, unrepentant homosexual behavior, was in no way an obstacle to church service or leadership or any other part of the life of the church. You cannot change the word of God to accommodate your own cultural opinions, and yet that is what many do. Truth is a reflection of God. God is good, therefore what he commands is good. It's not merely a matter of whether we agree with it or whether we think it's fair. It is good because he said so. So if we think about something uh, that we may teach our children from the earliest age, like stealing, why should we tell our children not to steal. There's a lot of reasons we might give, right? Because uh, it hurts the person we steal from. Okay, true enough. Uh, another deterrent to stealing would be if you get caught, you get in trouble. If you steal things, uh, the police come and take you to jail, right? That's a, a pretty strong deterrent. But ultimately, all of those things can be rationalized away. Well, I can do it in such a way that I won't get caught. Or, well, it's not really hurting anyone because this is a big corporation and they'll never miss it in the, any way. Or all kinds of rationalizations. The only thing that cannot be rationalized away is the reason we do not steal is because it is a violation of God's nature and His law. So why is stealing wrong? 
because God said it's wrong. The law is a reflection of God's character. But here's the point that Paul's making in this discussion. The good, righteous, perfect law of God, that is a reflection of his very nature, has been hijacked by sin. So the good law has been hijacked by sin. You remember that most famous verse in the book of Genesis, after everything is exposed between Joseph and his brothers, and he says to them, you meant it for evil, God meant it for good. Well, in a way, what Paul is saying here in Romans chapter 7, verses 7 through 12, is the opposite argument. Sin takes what is by definition good and holy and righteous and uses it for evil purposes. He uses it, Satan, sin itself, is the use of the good law to incite us to sin and to rebel against the same holy God that gave us the law in the first place. So let's just kind of take it slow for a moment. Let's back up and look at these verses together. So Paul asserts that the law had been the means by which he came to know sin. You remember that? Look, at, look back at verse 7. He says, yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. Now just consider that for a moment. If it weren't for the law, I would not have known sin. What Paul means by that is not simply that the law told Paul what sin was, but that the law, with its explicit spelling out, of the commandments of God gave sin the opportunity to stimulate rebellion against God and made absolutely clear his own sinfulness and his own death. So it's like a mirror, right? He looks at the law and he sees how horribly he has failed to keep that law. And by its very existence, the law defines what sin is. And in another strange way, it actually prompts us to desire to sin. And I know that seems kind of strange. We'll talk about it a little more. But our sinfulness uh, is the very labeling of an action as a transgression, now transgression is a violation, it's a specific kind of sin where God's law is violated, okay? And it is in this way that the law stimulates sinning and brings God's wrath. So this is what Paul has been talking about back in chapter 5 and verse 20. Here in verse 5 he says, uh, in chapter 7, verse 5, I should say, For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law. How does that even happen? Now, that our sin is aroused by the law? Yet that's what he says. We're at work in our members to bear fruit for death. So the law is proclaimed. I see now what sin is, and yet I still violate that law, and the result for me in the end is death. And that's what Paul says. He says in verse 9, I was once alive apart from the law. In other words, I was ignorant of the law. I was ignorant of, of what, it, what God's nature and his character was. So I thought I was doing just fine. I thought I was alive. Then he goes on to say, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. All of a sudden when I realized what the law actually was, I saw how dramatically I had failed in keeping that law. So he's ignorant of the law, so he perceives he's alive. When he becomes aware of the law, he is dead. 
So Paul explains this very complex teaching through his own experience. He keeps using that word, that pronoun I. You see it? It's found all throughout the seventh chapter of Romans. And there's basically three views that scholars have about who is the I. And the most logical choice of who the I refers to is Paul, right? And yet, some make the case that he is taking a more general view of humanity. And some people think the I is Adam, like Adam and Eve. Some scholars, uh, more of a minority, but some believe that the I refers to Israel. That Israel is the recipient of the law in particular, and that's what Paul's referring to. And then, of course, the third option is what I mentioned initially, that the I is simply referring to what we would expect it's referring to, and that is Paul. So I think the first two have, are very attractive if you, if you take the ideas of life and death in the grand scheme, you know, their full meaning. If you mean that to have life is to be joined to God, then only Adam truly lived before the law, right? Because all have sinned and fall short and the wages of sin is death. But what Paul is talking about is his, his coming of age, his, his intellectual understanding of sin. It's not that he was not taught the law from early childhood, but there came a point when he really understood what the law required. And at that point, he died. This has huge implications for how we uh, conduct child evangelism. How do we share the gospel with children? We have to make sure that children have an adequate understanding of what sin actually is. Sin is an abstract principle, right? Uh, it, it's something that we, that is out, it's not something we can touch and feel and taste. That's how kids think though. Initially, children are very concrete. That's why if we use a phrase with a young child, ask Jesus into your heart, then that's exactly what they're anticipating is happening. That there's a little room in my heart and Jesus is going to come and get into that room. That's not what we mean, right? We mean make him a part of your life. But it's crucially important that we make sure our children understand how miserably they have failed to keep the law of God. And I know that that is not popular, right? Because we have been taught... Uh, in, a, in a psychotherapy way that the greatest good we can do for our children is to build their self-esteem and make sure that they feel good about themselves and reward them even when they don't deserve to be rewarded. And we see what that leads to. It leads to an uh, attitude of entitlement. It leads to a lack of responsibility on their part. What we need to do in a loving way is to help our children understand how miserably short they have fallen of God's standard. They must recognize what sin is. This is part of what Paul is talking about. Tom Schreiner said this, Paul's own experience is a paradigm of the story of the human race. Indeed, Paul's own history mirrors the history of Adam and Israel. Same thing that happened to humanity as a whole through Adam happens in each one of our lives individually when we come to an awareness of the law. This is why a right understanding of the law is necessary before we get to the good news of grace and the free gift of salvation in Christ. So we've said this time and again, it's so crucially important. If we throw around terminology like being saved, that we love to do in the Bible Belt, especially in regard to the younger generation, in regard to millennials, their first question is going to be, saved from what? If you are saved, that implies inherently that you are saved from something to something, right? If you're drowning, you're saved from the water 
to the seashore or from the water to the boat. Well, if I speak religiously, if I use our language of Zion and I just throw around the phrase, are you saved? And I don't have a background in knowing what that means. Then I don't even know what you're talking about. You have to help people to understand that they're saved from the consequences of failing to keep the law. They have to see who God is and who they are as falling so drastically short. It's only when you understand the bad news that the good news really makes sense, right? So you have been given a death certificate by the law. You have been pronounced dead, as Paul says in this passage. But in Christ, we're made alive again through the gospel. That he paid the price for that sin. And by faith, we are justified. We are uh, receive his righteousness that is imputed to us. So Paul came to know sin. He experienced sin. He lived sin. He coveted before he knew what coveting was, but once he learned what coveting was, his guilt increased, right? He still was jealous for other people's stuff, even before he knew it was wrong to be jealous for other people's stuff. And once he found out it was wrong, then he was doubly guilty. To know the law and to actively violate the law brings more culpability, more responsibility than if we just violate the law in ignorance. And so why do you think our very first response is uh, when we're pulled over? Uh, I, do, I do a lot of speeding analogies, don't I? I think that you guys probably think that I am just racing around everywhere. If we pull over and what, what do we say? Immediately we say, um, I didn't know that was the speed limit. I didn't know. And the officer inevitably responds, ignorance of the law is no excuse. Right? That's our natural human response when we're caught doing something. And sometimes it's genuinely the case. I didn't know I wasn't supposed to do that. And that's part of the argument that Paul's making here is I was guilty even before I knew it was wrong, but once I knew it was wrong, then I was doubly guilty. That is the sense of Romans chapter 5 verse 13. For indeed sin, for sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. In other words, it's not the same kind of sin. It's not a transgression, a violation of something. Uh, chapter 2 talks about this. Chapter 4 talks about that. Because transgression is a particular type of sin. The Bible has a number of different terms for sin. Transgression, sin, iniquity, right? And it's the worst kind of sin transgression is. Because it is a sin that is a presumptuous sin. It is a sin that is committed in light of known law. By the way, just, just as an aside, um, Wesleyan theology uh, teaches that you can be perfect in the Christian life in this world through sanctification. And the reason, when we hear that and we think, how could we, I, I sin a hundred times a day, how could I possibly be perfect? Well, it's because they define sin in a specific kind of way. They define sin as only that which is a direct violation of a known law. In other words, there's a willingness, a desire to sin. You follow? So as long as I don't willingly desire to sin, then I could potentially not sin. We understand it not only in the sense of a transgression, but any time I do anything that is contrary to the will of God, I've sinned. Sometimes without even really acknowledging it, not even recognizing the level to which I have sinned. So now in verse 8 of chapter 7, Paul elaborates, But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandments, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. 
Once again, it's not that we are not sinning, it's that we don't see it in the same way. The guilt level is not the same in our experience. I'm not tempted to greater rebellion. So here's the bottom line. Jewish thought of the day would have said that the presence of the law curbs sin. Paul's saying the opposite. It's not the presence of the law that curbs sin. He's saying that while the law is very good, its presence only heightens an already sinful nature. Which is why you can make all of the gun laws you want in the world and it doesn't change the desire of people to harm one another. The presence of the law does not change human nature. St. Augustine in his book of confessions gives this illustration that I think you'll find familiar. He says, there was a pear tree near our vineyard laden with fruit. One stormy night we rascally youth set out to rob it and carry our spoils away. We took off a huge load of pears not to feast upon ourselves, but to throw them at the pigs. Though we ate just enough to have the pleasure of forbidden fruit, they were nice pears, but it was not the pears that my wretched soul coveted, for I had plenty better at home. I picked them simply in order to become a thief. The only feast I got was a feast of iniquity, and that I enjoyed to the full. What was it that I loved in that theft? Was it the pleasure of acting against the law in order that I, a prisoner under rules, might have a maimed counterfeit freedom by doing what was forbidden? With a dim similitude of omnipotence, the desire to steal was awakened simply by the prohibition of stealing. You see what he's saying there? There's something within sin nature that we tell ourselves, I want to do whatever I want to do. And I don't care what rule it breaks. And there is in that sin nature even a kind of exhilaration in breaking the rules, right? So we see this in relationships all around us, right? Someone is a moral, upstanding person, and what do they get labeled? Goody two-shoes, right? They're just a rule follower. They always do what's right. And they might be coaxed by their peers. Come on, break a rule every once in a while. You'll love it. Well, the very presence of the rule heightens the desire to do that. You try that. You, you try that experiment with your children. You tell them, you know, don't, don't go ride your bike in the driveway. Well, it doesn't matter if they hadn't ridden their bike in two months. That's all they're going to be able to think about is, I got to get that bike and ride in the driveway. They just want to do it, right? Why? Because they have been prohibited from doing so. We just naturally, in our sin nature, want to do that. So, I come back full circle to say this. The law doesn't keep people from sinning. In many cases, their sin nature works with the law to sin even more. The point is often made that only after a rule is put in place... Do people want to do whatever that particular rule forbids? And what Paul is saying, though, goes far beyond psychological reasons for doing that. Psychological observation that stolen fruits are the sweetest. From a human perspective, the law is mistakenly viewed as a restriction that creates resentment and gives rise to rebellion in sinful hearts. So when we, when we tell someone, here's what God expects, we're talking about a non-Christian, an unbeliever, here's God's expectation. Their sinful response is going to be, 
I don't have to do what that God says. I can do whatever I want to do. Don't steal. I don't care. I'm going to do it anyway. In the sinful heart, there is no pure motivation for keeping the rules. There is only a desire to avoid negative consequences from breaking the rules. So why do you not steal? Is it because you don't want to get caught? Or because you know that God has said theft is wrong and it's a violation of his nature and character to do so. And that's your motivation. That is a God honoring motivation. So the law is good. It is the standard of our behavior. But outside of Christ it is only uh, working with sin to create a spirit of rebellion. That which is the very attribute of life really only confirms death. This is verses 10 and 11. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death. For sin seizing an opportunity through the commandment deceived me and through it killed me. Paul's saying I was deceived. Well guess what? That's Satan's M.O. He is the father of lies. Satan always takes what is good and twists it to something evil and self-serving. Everything on his agenda is to take that pure and holy nature of God reflected in the law and incite people to do all things contrary to that revealed nature. And guess what? He doesn't have to work very hard at doing that because our sin nature is already inclined to sin. So it's not like we have to have our arms twisted. So what's the solution to this? What's the remedy to this? He's already told us. Christ alone. Christ alone. So the law is good, sin is bad. But when sin hijacks the law, there's a bad result. And as we go forward then, next time as we talk about this further into chapter 7, we ask the question, then does something, how I should say, uh, or does something good like the law bring our death. How does that all fit together? So I want you to be very clear as we conclude this morning that humanity is by nature born into sin. Even if we don't know what it's called, you may never hear the word covet, but your heart is going to covet. You may never hear the word steal, but you're going to desire to steal. And that nature cannot be changed merely by desiring to change it. It's not merely a matter of setting a New Year's resolution, or you're going to turn over a new leaf, or you're going to try harder, or you're going to go through a 12-step plan, or you're going to join a support group. No. It is only changed one way. And that is by the supernatural and miraculous transforming power of God through the Holy Spirit. You are saved by grace through faith in Christ. And that is the big difference. Would you stand as we close our time today? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you for the law. We even thank you, Lord, that though it brings death, you have granted us life. Lord, impress upon us the truth 
of a crucified and resurrected Lord that we may serve you. In Jesus' name, amen.